once again, <laughs> welcome. Um, but okay, so we have a few project managers here. That is great to know. Um, I myself am a technical project manager with Agilina, so I'm here with them, and I'm also here with Drupal GovCon and Drupal for Gov. So I'm having kind of two hats at the moment. Uh, but what we're gonna be discussing today is sort of how do you balance being a project manager and having to do resourcing with like being a decent human being, which is surprisingly harder than it seems. So I've been struggling with this myself and I've learned some really important lessons. I will talk in depth about my failures and hopefully you can learn some lessons from me as well. All right, so my agenda. What you're gonna notice is the way I kind of do this session is very much teacher style. So I used to be a teacher for seven years. So we're gonna start with success criteria. And basically what that is, it's coming out of the session, you should have learned something. You should have gained some concrete knowledge and we're gonna evaluate whether I did my job correctly. Hopefully yes, but you will have success criteria on which to evaluate yourselves. Next, we're gonna look at my receipts. So why should you listen to me? Why is what I'm saying matters? Where, is my, where are my credentials? I'm gonna break those down for you. Next, we're gonna define some terms. I want us all to have basically the same understanding when I say capacity or resourcing, and we were gonna share this knowledge together because sometimes we have an idea of what that means, but then someone starts talking about it and we realize, oh no, we have a different definition. So we're gonna have the same definition together. I will give you one real world example because we have 45 minutes and that example will take forever. And then you're actually gonna practice Oh, in two groups, perfect, like three and three. So you'll practice um, with a scenario that I give you. And you're gonna actually figure out how to resource this make-believe project, these make-believe developers. So you will really put it into practice. And last but not least, we'll have a closing. And that's pretty much gonna be the entire time. So, be, oh, there we go. Before we dive in, if any of you looked online, you'll note that this is a Certification class, what? Yes, okay. So, very excited to announce that upon completion of this session, you will get a brand spanking certificate. It is real, I'm so excited about it. Um, but it is from Agilina and Drupal for Gov, and it is one hour toward ways of working if you are going after a PMP. So you need to have certain hours for three different things to get the PMP or renew it. This is one hour toward that. Very exciting for me. Okay, now we're gonna dive in. Our success criteria. There are really three things that I want you to take away from this. The first is how to make empathy-led decisions and kind of how to work with your team to make these decisions. So that's gonna be the first thing I really want you to learn. The second is capacity efficiency and probability, and using all of those together. So how do we use capacity planning um, with efficiency? How do we use probability to give our clients an actual data when things are done instead of, hey, I need it by April 15th. Okay, we'll make it happen. Because that's like very, very bad to say, and I've done that myself. And I've learned, hey, we have about a 50% probability of actually getting that to you by April 15th. Oh, okay. But we can deprioritize these items and get it to you by April 15th, but just know like, it's gonna affect the timeline. Oh, you know what? I don't need that by April 15th. Just get it to me whenever you get it to me. And that's a much easier conversation to have based on probability. <clears throat> Last but not least, know your team and ask the right questions. This is something I'm still like getting to do. Um, asking the right questions is one of the hardest things I think you'll do in project management. Um, you don't know what you don't know, right? So there's no like question or list of questions I can give you that you should ask automatically when you go into a project, but it's how you're thinking about things that I'm gonna try and instill in you. How do you walk into a project, take the lay of the land, and then figure out the right questions to ask based on who's in that room? That's what I'm hoping you'll get out of it, but there is like no hard and fast list that I can present, unfortunately. I wish there was. That would be very useful for me. But this is what I want you to get out of it. 
how to make empathy-led decisions, how to use capacity, probability, and efficiency, and then how to know your team and ask the right questions. And by the end of this, I hope that you will have gathered these three things and have an understanding of them. So, my receipts. I have a lot of certifications, which all basically do the same thing, but I have a certified scrum master, certified product owner, a safe um, certified scrum master. Uh, I have all of my teaching certificates, which are now useless, but they took so long to get. Um, so excitingly, I've been teaching Hawaii, <laughs> Maryland, um, and then I also have a bunch of international baccalaureates. And the reason I'm doing this is because, you should listen to me, because this was my job for seven years, and also I come with some really cool credentials. What you'll notice is I do not have my PMP, because it takes forever <laughs> to get your PMP. So I'm working toward it, but it is just taking way too long. Uh, but this session actually helps me because I get one hour toward getting my PMP by doing this as well. So two birds, one stone. Now, our shared terms. Resourcing. Resourcing is, and I'm just going to read it. Actually, no, I'm not going to read it off. Can someone read it off for me? I'm going to be a teacher right now. Who would like to raise their hand and read me the definition? Slash, I will just call on someone. Thank you, Kirsten, yes. Yes. Resourcing is identifying, allocating, and managing the necessary team members to complete a project successfully. Well done. So, now we all know, when I say resourcing, this is what I am referring to. All right, efficiency. Bernardo, thank you so much. Sure. The best use of time, money, materials, and team members to complete the project while minimizing waste and maximizing well done, thank you so much. Um, empathy, sir in the gray jacket. The ability to understand and share the feelings, perspectives, and experiences of others. Thank you so much, Chris, and I realize I do not have my badge on. My name's Nina. <laughs> Had that question. Um, flow, sir in the jacket shirt. Smooth, uninterrupted progression of work from start to finish. Excellent. And capacity, sir, in the gray shirt. The maximum amount of work that can be completed within the given time frame with the given resources. Excellent. So I will say these terms a lot. Resourcing, efficiency, uh, capacity, uh, flow, and empathy. So now that we have kind of a shared definition, does everyone like feel like they have an understanding of these terms moving forward? Excellent. So now that we have that shared definition, my real world example, where I failed spectacularly. <sighs> okay. So this is close to the actual team that I had. I tried to keep it as close to what really happened within this project as possible while excluding people's names. So here was my project. I was brought into a failing project because I did something really well. I loved me some charts, some numbers. I was really, really good at capacity planning and at doing things like coming up with um, understandings of why we were doing certain things in certain teams. So I did a lot of spreadsheets. Ooh, I became a fan of Excel. And I did a lot of reporting. So my boss said, you know, you're super good at that. I really want you to come and try and figure out what's going on with this team. And he gave me a lot of information right off the bat. He said, this team is constantly rolling over tickets. They are constantly having their tickets reopen because it's shoddy work, it's not quality. They are like working overtime consistently. So they're putting in about 60 to 80 hours a week on average. In addition, just like the, the client's unsatisfied and it's just, not working. And I was given a task. He said, the team must deliver 56 story points. That's SPS. Story points every two weeks for three sprints. He had agreed to take on some additional work from the client. It was about 16 story points. And with the team that we had, I already could tell 
and that's not happening. So I said, we're gonna automatically need a new person. Can you get me a person? Now, this is my core team, I had me, three devs, that was it. I also had kind of to the side, kind of in and out, one of them was like ghosts, a team lead and a technical architect. And then I had my brand new member who was gonna start any day now. Now this is what I walked into. So when my boss told me, hey, you're gonna have to deliver 56 story points every two weeks or three weeks. I said, okay. And that's when I first fucked up. You know, like, <laughs> that's knowing nothing. I just said, okay. And I've learned never to do that. That was my first mistake. So I learned a very valuable lesson that day. I learned how to ask questions. What I didn't do previously is I didn't check in with any of my team members to evaluate their mental health or just how they were doing. You know, they're working 60 to 80 hours. Everyone's burned out. Well, like, what does that mean? What does that look like? Checking with people. Didn't do that. And no real clue what each individual person's workload was. I was like, we're a team. Together we do 56 story points. Well, if anyone's been on a team, it's not always the case. One member might do 20 of those story points. Another member might do, you know, 20 more of those story points. And then you'll just have someone kind of off to the side delivering three story points, you know, hoping no one sees him. And then the work just doesn't get done, right? And you're constantly rolling over. So I had no clue what anyone's actual workload was. I also had no clue what anyone's actual like job was. They were devs, okay, cool. So in my brain, I was just like, oh, they're full stack. <laughs> no, <laughs> they weren't. So I didn't know what they didn't know and I didn't know what they did know. I had a knowledge, a huge knowledge gap in fact. I also had no clue what the actual work we were doing was. I was just kind of brought in to fix the team without having any understanding of what the project was. What were we delivering to the client? Who knows, it doesn't matter. You're just supposed to fix the team. Okay, I guess. So, there was that. I also didn't actually know anyone. I had not worked with these people before. So I didn't know, you know, so-and-so's birthday is next week. Like, oh, heck, happy birthday. <laughs> I had no clue about any of them. And last, I didn't know there were members of my team on other projects. They were all balancing multiple things, which I just did not know because again, I went in there and I said the worst word you can possibly say, okay, knowing nothing. Valuable lesson I learned, <laughs> ask, Questions, but not only ask questions, ask the right questions. So I started by asking these three questions, which were fine. Right. What are we doing? Well, we are uh, migrating a site. Okay, what kind of migration are we doing? Well, it's a Drupal 7 and Drupal 10 migration. Okay, I, I understand that. Okay, and it's about four sites. Okay, so four sites migrating Drupal 7, Drupal 10. Got it, makes sense. So where, where is this work taking place, right? Is it Jira, is it like Bitbucket? Like is it the client server? Like just where is this work being done? Do I have visibility to that? So ask those questions and then when, which to me, as <laughs> project manager, is like the least important question even though many people say it's the most important. When you go into a project, you kind of know your end date, right? It's pretty much set in stone when you first do an RFP or propose it to a client. We're going to have it done by June 20th. It, it's more or less immovable. It is what it is. So to me, it's the least important question because you often go in knowing what it is anyway. When are our sprints? When do we need the work done? Sure. I didn't ask who was going to do this work, which I learned the hard way. Or, okay, so if so-and-so is doing the work, what's their background? Do they have the skills to be able to do this work? 
do they need to take training? Do I need to get them training to be able to do it successfully? We're using Storybook. Do our developers know how to use Storybook? Does the new person that's coming onto the team know how to use Storybook? No, the answer was no. <laughs> so how are we doing any of this? Is it through uh, relative sizing, right? Are we doing like hours? How is this work getting done? How are we tracking this work? How are we evaluating whether it's successful or not? What is our definition of done? What is our acceptance criteria? How is any of this happening? And then why? And my team took almost eight months to answer the why, which is crazy, I know. But their answer when I asked them, well, why are we doing this work, was inevitably because the client wants it done. Okay, but like, why are you doing this work? Because I need a paycheck. Right, okay, no, I, I, like, I know those basic ones, but like, why is it important that this work gets done? Why does it matter? What, like, who is it impacting? All of these different things, my, my team couldn't answer that for a long time. So that told me there was no buy-in. They didn't care. If you don't care about something, you're not going to put a lot of effort into it. So why were tickets getting reopened? Because they were half-assed. I mean, that's kind of one of the reasons. Because they were stressed, because they just wanted it done, because there wasn't a lot of care put into it. And also, like, it didn't matter because they couldn't answer why it mattered. So then, I started to ask these questions. And I asked many questions, and they got really, really annoyed with all my questions. But I figured out that there was me, and then there was a senior front-end dev. Oh my goodness, fantastic. OK, so you do front-end dev stuff. So you should be able to do anything that's front-end. Well, I still have to learn some things. OK, fine. What do you need to learn? Let me get you that training. And then I learned I have a senior full stack. Dev. OK, fantastic. So you should be able to do a couple of different things. And I also learned that they were a, a technical architect in a previous role. Oh, even better, you can help us refine tickets and set some implementation details. Perfect. Again, making assumptions. And then I also learned we had a back-end dev. OK, awesome. Just back-end, nothing else. And our new team member, despite the fact that I believed they were going to be mid to senior, came in at a junior level. A junior developer expected to deliver 16 story points in two weeks having no idea what storybook was or what the project we were working on was or anything like that. We set him up for failure, 100%. And he didn't last long, to be honest with that. Um, and I think in large part that's due to me not asking the right questions, um, me not vetting this person, but also the team not having buy-in to who is coming onto the team. When you don't have the team like actively working to say, here's who we need to make our lives easier, then just there's another person doing work. It doesn't really matter. So that was the other thing I learned. <laughs> now, team lead and techno are still there. It's kind of floating again like ghosts in the background. They were helping, don't get me wrong, but things were still not quite working the way they needed to work. And so, I don't know if you've experienced this, but you might tell your team leader, hey, I need help with this, right? My, my, my uh, backend dev doesn't quite know how to do this or to this degree, could you help them? And I learned that wasn't quite the right approach I should have taken, probably should have done peer programming. Because they would blow in after having, you know, context switched like eight times in a day, they'd have 10 minutes on their calendar, come in, randomly spout a bunch of crap, and then just leave, like just ghost out of it. And then they would be very upset when, you know, a few days later it wasn't done to their very specific specifications. And I learned through trial and error that if someone doesn't have the time to dedicate, then they're also not going to do it in a way that's understandable. If you're just blowing in and out, 
no one really knows what you're actually doing and you're not helping all that much as much as you are just hurting the team overall. Learn that the hard way. So I started asking the right questions, but I still had to deliver these 56 story points. I was feeling so good about it. Like, honestly, I was like on the right track. I'd ask all these questions. I was kind of trying to get people um, the knowledge that they needed. I knew what everyone's role was. I was assigning, I was assigning tickets. I was assigning tickets out. So I felt like we could absolutely do this. We could do this. Anyone want to guess how many story points we delivered? Two? Twelve. Twenty-three? Twelve? Twenty-three. Twenty-three? One. One. We delivered 86. I was wrong. It was actually 86. We delivered 86. You're probably going, I did say seven. No, I look back at my notes. It was 86. I took, took notes of this project. It was 86. And now you're like, that's insane. No. Remember when I first told you, a lot of rollover. So at least 20 of these tickets were just rollover. But that still doesn't account for an additional 10 that were worked on. What were those 10? Oh, they were bug tickets because all of our stuff was super buggy. So we had 30 tickets, 20 tickets of rollover, 10 tickets that were buggy. We kind of did most of the work, but the client was also doing something that I didn't realize because it wasn't my board. They were putting in tickets randomly and then pulling out tickets that I even worked on randomly. So I was getting to like, you know, three days before the sprint ended and why was there a five story point ticket in the sprint? I don't remember seeing that. Like at the start, it's not my board. I didn't set those expectations with the client. And so I learned another super valuable lesson. Oh, all the lessons I learned. So I go back to this because what I didn't do is I wasn't really doing proper, useful capacity planning. And I wasn't using efficiency in my capacity planning. And I wasn't using probability to discuss anything with the client. They were giving me dates, and I was just saying we would meet them. Useless, absolutely wasteful, would not recommend. I also learned more things. That team lead, oh, he was full time, but he had five extra projects, absolutely useless. That uh, technical architect was full time with eight extra projects, absolutely useless. My me was full time with two other projects. I wasn't as useless as I probably could have been, but like I was still shuffling between things. I had three monitors, and I thought incorrectly. Um, I have four now, but but I thought incorrectly that uh, it's one project per monitor. Right, and I could just literally switch, and then my brain would just naturally know how to do that. You know, unrealistic completely. I had my senior friend in dev, who was on another project, again, did not know this. My senior full stack that was actually part time. I did not learn this until the second sprint. So a whole month had passed of me just being like, God, he is never online. <laughs> Gotta to talk to him about that. And then my back end dev was on another project. So if you're looking at this, no one on the team was fully allocated to this client. Not a single team member. A client that we have to deliver 56 story points to. And yes, it's weird that we're delivering story points. Part of the contract can do nothing about that. But a client who we have to deliver like 56 story points doesn't have a single dedicated resource. I didn't know that until I again asked the question and then started to capacity plan. But that new resource was not only full time, he was new to the company because he was from, he had just started. I just did not realize he had just started. So he was also being onboarded at the exact same time. All these things I found out later. So, my first attempt at capacity, ooh, no, efficiency. Oh, I was way ahead of myself. Not way ahead of myself. So I started using efficiency formulas because I wanted to understand, okay, so like, what, what's going on? Like, what is our actual efficiency? Most of our team was scoring like 50%. 
they were 50% efficient. Their 40 hours a week was often 80, right? 60. They were just not being efficient. Well, they couldn't be. They were constantly context switching, going between projects, not to mention just, you know, doing random stuff that the company asked for. So they weren't efficient. And I learned that because I was doing math. Super exciting. But then I started to do a little bit of research because I really wanted to understand like the cost of not having a dedicated resource. And so I was like, I wonder, I wonder if when someone's on another project, it's not 50-50. Because like, I'm on another project and I for sure know it's not 50-50. <laughs> I know that's not right. But what I learned from the, this is actually from, I believe it's Cambridge, but you can find this um, chart of many places, it's been done a few times, is that when someone is fully dedicated to a project, 100%, there is no context switching, they are yours, right? You're not gonna lose that time. Those 40 hours can often be 40 hours, maybe 38 or like 35 with lunch and a few breaks during the week, but like, it's dedicated. You're gonna get the time out of it, not gonna have a, contact, a lot of context switching, and you can probably assign them like the actual number of story points they are able to do, versus someone who has two projects. It's not a 50-50 split. It's like a 40-40 split, because they now have to switch their brain. And surprisingly enough, it's not as easy as just turning your neck to a different screen. So, I lost. 20% automatically, just because you're on another project. If you're on three projects, ooh, I lost 40%. And then it just continued to go down because you're constantly switching. Because as if you ever worked, worked for a uh, small company, even though you might be a front-end dev, if you go to another project, you are the project manager, which is a completely different skill set. So it wasn't that my senior front-end dev um, had another project, it was that on that other project, they were the lead, which is different. They were helping juniors. They were uh, refining tickets. They were trying to get their certifications to be able to pass on their knowledge. It was a very different effort and skill set that they needed for that other project than mine. So I learned all these things. And then I started to try and incorporate that in my first ever attempt at capacity planning. Now this isn't mine, but I stole this and basically used the same thing. And I was so shocked when I saw this, I was like, oh my God, it's been so many years. Oof, I love a good color coding. So I was like, this is gonna work perfectly. Um, what you'll notice is it's hella busy. It's just super busy. It's not giving really any information that's gonna help with understanding people's actual allocation of the work they're doing. It doesn't really matter that someone's in a retrospective for an hour. What matters is what they're actually working on as part of the team. How many meetings are in Scrum? I really only needed this number. Didn't need all this rest of stuff. Useless, I rarely ever changed it. The non-Scrum meetings, meaning like meetings that they had with their manager, one-on-ones, guild meetings, I didn't really need to break all these meetings down because you know what I was doing? I was going into individual calendars for these people. <laughs> and I'm like, you're entering it here? <laughs> and I just couldn't understand why it wasn't working. And then the subtotal of not repeating, PTO on holidays. Again, didn't need all this extra information, but I at least knew I needed this individual factor, which really was that efficiency number. And I looked at what was the difference? So mine were a little bit more rounded. It was like, okay, I know they're on another project. They're not gonna be able to do 20% automatically. I'm gonna cancel that out, right? They're on three projects, I'm gonna cancel out 40%. And I was using those numbers here, getting a little bit closer to be able to present hours available for a sprint. And I thought that was super awesome. I'm like, you have 20 hours, they can do this. We were doing relative sizing. And even though I had taken Certified Scrum Master course, even though I knew better. My next attempt, version two, transposed hours into story points. Mm -hmm. Oh, I heard whoever, whoever had that noise, yes, yes. It was not the right way to do it, which I learned yet again the hard way. So this is my version two, much simpler, still loving the colors. And again, this was an example, but 
I do not recreate a wheel. I find stuff, and then I just kind of tweak it to work for me. This is more or less what I had, and so I changed it slightly. I added a location because not all of my developers were in the U.S. Not all of them were on the eastern coast. Some of them, uh, one of them was in Ukraine, which I'm going to talk about later because that matters to empathy. Uh, a couple of them were in India. And like that mattered with when they were able to respond. So when I was messaging them at 3 p.m. on a Monday, I was disturbing their sleep. So I stopped doing that. But I had to constantly remind myself where they were so that I didn't interfere with them. And I tried to set those guardrails for myself. I also took away that here's when they're not available and looked at when they actually are available. We have 80% of their time in this project. Or we have 60% or something like that. And then, incorrectly, I started to equate hours and story points. And now I did this in what I thought was really unique and super cool way. I looked at the hours they worked in a week and they clocked. And then I looked at how many story points they actually got done. And I averaged that over 30 sprints and then I was like, oh, okay. So one story point should take this developer about 3.33 hours. <laughs> that's what I did. And like, that's not how you're supposed to do it because it's totally useless. But that's how I was doing it. This is my version two. And then, sprint ended, had the lower 56 story points. Yet again, we rolled over. Yet again, we just did not end up completing our 56. We ended up with something like 70, less than the 86 before, but still way too high. Again, a lot of bug tickets. So I thought again, okay, there's got to be an easier way to do this. And I'm a big fan of, again, not recreating the wheel. And so I tried to do a little bit of research into programs because if anyone's used a Google Sheet or like Excel Sheet, at a certain point, you lose track of your formulas because you've looked at it way too many times. And it gets super messy. And if anyone touches it, God forbid someone had actually touched one of my sheets, I, would, I was livid. It's like, you messed up everything. I can't tell where anything is now. So I was like, that's stressing me out. That's not actually what I need. And I found Actionable Agile. This is not a sponsored post, I just really like it. But this gave me an understanding of their throughput for a sprint. And then it gave me an understanding with the Monte Carlo, this is just an example one, of like the work they were doing by specific dates. So I could tell my client, we get about 90, uh, we can do this, project or this task by, you know, like the third of whatever, um, and you have about a 94% chance of it getting done by that time. 100%, like 94% chance, 100% as I almost said it. And that's what I tried to communicate with them. I'm like, here is the data, and actionable, uh, actionable Agile has a bunch of different data points. And I would show this at the start of every single daily stand-up. Like, this is what we've done, these are our metrics, this is not anyone's feelings, this is not my very jangy Excel spreadsheet. This is the data that we are getting based on the sprints. And the client would start seeing these. And so then they inevitably started asking, well, can we have this delivered by X date? All I would do is I would go here, I would click on that date, I would read them, I would literally just say, well, Data tells me it's about 70%, so I can give you 70% certainty. And that relationship changed for the client and I. They were able to actually see in real time sort of what was going on in the work that was being done. And this also gave my developers a way to speak to their managers, which they didn't always have. So it started to become really useful. And this, if anyone, I, like, I highly recommend Action by Agile. You can get the extension on Jira. It was very useful for me to use. So I had a little bit of a better way of doing it. But I was missing a key component, which is that people are people. Does anyone know who this is, by the way? No? It's Depeche Mode. <laughs> it's okay. I'm old at heart. But 
So I was missing the fundamental concept, which is that people are people, right? I can have all the charts in the world that I want, but I can't stop one, someone's child getting sick and them having to take off work. I, I can't anticipate um, someone's mother falling and now they are suddenly having to deal with elder care. And I didn't know any of these things because I didn't know my team still. I was viewing my team through data, which is one way of doing it, but it is not the only way of doing it. And this is where we kind of go into empathy-led decision-making. My new junior dev, who was full-time and new to the country, was in Ukraine. And wow, had I known that, I think a lot of our interactions would have been different. He constantly had issues with his internet. I could not understand that. He seemed to be worried at random times, which I just didn't understand. He never wanted to have his video on because he didn't feel comfortable with where he was physically. I knew none of that until I started to get to know my team. And then I was able to make a couple of decisions based off of this information. Another one, another team member that's in your front end they were moving, and it was about to be a festival called Diwali, which is a huge festival in India. They were gonna take time off. So they're already dealing with some other things in their life. I had another one who was the part-timer. There were layoffs at his job. Like, that was just weighing on his mind all the time, and he had three kids who were constantly running in and out because of the way his uh, house was built. So he had a station, but sometimes the kids would just come. So they didn't get to see their you know, dad all day. I had another one who, again, there was elder care. And he was just burned out. He was burned out. And I didn't know a lot of these things until I started having conversations and one-on-ones. And what I realized is that I could make decisions based on data alone. I'd been doing it for a while. But if I did that, I was missing a huge data set. And I was just missing a lot of context that I needed. So instead of me being the project manager and making all the decisions, which is what had been happening, I switched my model to be a consensus-driven model. Yes, I was absolutely still accountable for this. I was responsible. But there needed to be buy-in. So we started freezing certain times, not just a development freeze, but like we are not going to do X during this time because no one's gonna be here. No one works during Christmas, right? I'm not even gonna schedule anything on that time. That's useless, right? Or I know that three of my developers are gonna be at a thing. We're not even gonna, we're not gonna do anything. No calls are gonna happen at that time. We started looking at our calendar critically and scheduling things based on really what was going on. We also started to be more transparent. And this was hard because project managers are often kind of seen as ah, that was the gatekeepers, talking heads, kind of the stakeholders. So that transparency aspect, aspect was really, really hard to get to. Um, it was harder for them to open up to me. And it was hard for me to like keep their trust because I had to do a balancing act between being real with my stakeholders and being real with my team. And that's hard don't have a good like way to do that besides try and be transparent as possible but also within the realm of like realism oh my goodness time moving so fast oh I'm not gonna get my scenario I'm so sad um the language we used also changed we stopped using words like burnout or burn hot no one wants to burn and we started <laughs> using things <laughs> oh my oh, god um, we started using words like, here's what we are committed to doing. And that commitment was what we held each other to. Not like, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, you can do anything. But what are you committed to getting done? And this change in language made a huge difference on the team. We only committed to what we were going to do. Everything else was secondary. If we didn't commit to it. If it happened, great. If it didn't, that's okay. But we got our commitments done. Next, we made a contract that we held 
everyone accountable for, even me, which I got called out a few times. And we made this contract together. Not every team does a team contract. I highly encourage it. Last but not least, we stopped doing, um, we stopped doing client-driven dates and started doing probability. So the client said, I need it by April 20th, 9th. We would say, okay, well, it's about a 60% probability of getting done there with our current workload. Oh, well, okay. Well, now if we change some things, here's the probability of that. So we did probability based with the client. We stopped saying, okay, we gave them numbers. But last but not least, we started doing empathy. So people's lives change, right? Again, we had elder care. So sometimes he would, we had a developer who just had to be away from his desk to go and help his mother, period. We accepted that. We took that on. We changed certain things. We allowed him that space. We allowed him slightly different working hours. And I worked with my boss to make this happen as well. So it wasn't just like the team. It was the team and the owner and a couple of other people making this happen. But we started looking at driving our work through empathy. And it changed significantly. But I'm not going to talk about the change yet because oh, I'm so upset that it's like 45. I really thought I was pacing myself well. Um, I wanted to do a scenario with you. But maybe you'll have to do it later. But we can talk about it. So in practice, I wanted this scenario, which is that we had a project that was a Drupal migration. It's 12 months. It's May 15th is when we start. We're going to migrate four sites. And we're post-discovery. First three you know, sprints are done. We have a junior dev front end, senior front end, 50% allocated, project manager full time on the project, Backend developer number one is also performing QA duties about 30% of their time. You have a backend developer number two is full time in the project. Then we have a technical architect who's about on two other projects. We're falling behind schedule. Tickets are getting reopened, rolled over. We don't have goals. The acceptance criteria for individual tickets are not meeting the definition of done, and a bunch of other things. How might you approach this based on the conversation that I've been talking at you with? What questions might you ask? Yeah. I mean, I, I start with asking developers, like, why do you think, uh, you know, we're falling behind? I, I, I find asking the team, they have very clear perspectives oftentimes. Absolutely. And I like that asking the team, not asking your technical architect or individuals, but asking everyone together. What else might you do? I, I would be asking who's got the experience, who's the subject matter expert in do, A, doing the migrations, but also maybe writing the automated tests so you can address the, 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 the bounce backs and, and the bumps, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. Exactly. At Agilina, we call that right person, right seat. And we do that a lot. We look at, is this the right person to be in this role on this team right now? Yeah, anyone else? What other questions might you ask? I think you, know, you, know, you have allocation of resources, but also what's the practical allocation? You know, if they're on another project, they're in crunch time, and they, they don't get to work on the project. What else is going on in their lives as well? Mm -hmm. you know, the vacation, the holidays, and yep. what your true capacity is. Exactly. Well done. The true go back to that is something you will, no matter what project you go to, we're going to struggle with it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, to tie to that, I think mm -hmm. when I think of team morale, I also think of like maybe some one on ones need to happen, right? Because it's great to have a team conversation, but you never know what a person is facing in their personal mm -hmm. lives or things like that. And I will be trying to dig in and figure out why the team's morale is going down. Right. That's exactly it. If you're not happy, you definitely don't do good work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well done. Yeah. We'll ask the question like, do you know your role on the team? Do you yep. know what it is that we expect out of you? Mm -hmm. And the time expectation of the role? Because a lot of times, um, as if you're not the one that's conducting or you're not the supervision, as a person that's working for someone, yep. sometimes you get confused on what your roles are. Mm -hmm. you don't know should I ask? I don't want to seem like I don't know what I'm doing, so they might be intimidated. So, yeah. 
think that that kind of opens up a lot of conversation. Oh, I absolutely agree. I was on a project where they didn't know their roles. Yeah. I was told their roles, and then I had to tell them their roles. Right. And it was a really awkward conversation to have. So yeah, you're absolutely right. In addition right. to that, too, hmm. you, have to look, you have to look at the culture. Do you have a culture of, of sharing a parent program, yep. mm -hmm. uh, you know, holding each other accountable without pointing fingers, you know, that, yes. that sort of stuff? Because if you don't have the, the right culture, none of the rest of it matters. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Culture matters largely in a company. And what you can do to you know, work within that culture or make some changes for it. I wish we had more time and I wish I had looked at the clock more. But, but um, we've reached the end. So my final closing is that I hope you are able to take away how to make empathy-led decisions, the understanding your team. I hope you will consider using probability with a client next time instead of agreeing to a date. I hope that you're going to change your capacity. Versions are great. I change them all the time depending on the team and that you're looking at the efficiency as not being a bad thing, which I think it does tend to be, but being something useful for understanding what they're actually able to do on a team. Last, understanding your team is incredibly important and asking the right questions in that scenario. Now, I hope you're able to get these three and start to sort of think about these critically. And last but not least, if you want to get your certificate, all I need is your first name and last name and email. You can scan it right there if you don't have a phone for whatever reason. I can also just give you the, the, the URL. I'll just come and type your email and send it to you. But type this in. I will have it to you by the end of the day. And yeah, you'll get a fancy new certificate. Woo, 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 woo. All right, and I mean, this is, this is it. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Yeah. It's my only second time doing a presentation. You did great. Thank you so much. Oh, she was a teacher. I know, but like, but it's different. She lots of presentations. It's, well, like my second tech conference, and it's different. I like, I think I got used to like 90 minutes. Cause, oh, God, 45 minutes went so fast. Awesome. All right. I got like, what? Ooh, nine minutes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, oh my god, yes. Yeah, I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about sort of that initial transition when you started talking to the client about moving over the probability based thing. Because that you know, it sounds really hard. It was. It was. So I, I think the conversation is much easier to have when you have data. So what I did is I made everything transparent in terms of data. Like it was on their Jira board, so I asked, hey, can I install actionable agile on your Jira? Like, what is it? Okay, it's this, and here's what it's going to look like, and here's what it's going to do. Okay, let's give it a try. And then once that started happening, I started using that and incorporating it into our sandbox. So they got really used to seeing it. And then once they got used to the technology and seeing it and how we did it, when they started to ask for those deadlines, I said, well, you know, let's just take a look at action of agile you know, what they say. Well, it looks like, I think we can do it, like, there's a 50% chance of it. This is going to be pretty hard. What if we kind of take up these short points out of the sprint and let's kind of make see, you know, see these numbers again? And we did that. And then it changed to 75%. And just having them being able to have that flexibility made it a lot easier. And it wasn't me secretly going and running some numbers or let me talk to my boss in the back. It was, here it is, here's the information. You can look at it yourself. And I think that transparency aspect was really important for our relationship. Yeah. I wish I had a better example, but that's the one I've run into, just being as transparent as possible, and I should probably turn this off. <laughs> <laughs>